Hi, my name is Bob Gunia, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. This is Project Fuku, and we are looking at a number of samples here that are either the same, exactly the same as, or equivalent to, or near as damn it, equivalent to those which we tested in 2019 with Roishan Amaza's Amaza gas. And uh, in fact, what we have here, if you look at the video on the MFMP YouTube channel called uh, The End of the Beginning, uh, you will see during that uh, couple of hour stream t several things being tested and one of them is this piece of PTFE which uh, I touched and uh, it caused me some sort of tingling going on in my fingers so we are going to expose the other end of the PTFE uh, to uh, this HHO to see if we get the same carbonizing effect and also I don't know if you can see whether it's clear enough this area here this part here was where it touched uh, um, some other materials like the uh, titanium and there was an explosion and we got some quantum coherent formation of crystals with voids according to Solon and uh, some transmutation going on there and still more data to share on that analysis but uh, anyway we're going to see if we get the same kind of effect here uh, using the HHO. This is actually one of the steel plate, uh, titanium plates rather, that you saw in Japan being exposed to a Mars gas. So we will expose some of it over here to see the kind of relative speed of interaction uh, between the HHO and this titanium compared to a Mars gas. And uh, so we can see if that happens. This is some fresh indium because we used all of our indium foil in Japan. Some of the indium foil we exposed uh, to the vibrator system in the tank and we found that it was extremely uh, much harder afterwards and it also had these uh, soliton impact uh, zones on it and so that was interesting but we also exposed it to the gas and it behaved extremely weirdly. Now I don't know the thickness of this, maybe it's on here I can't see the thickness, but it was um, uh, the thickness of an Asian human hair, the sample that we had, uh, that we used in Japan. And it's interesting because when we applied the gas to it, it didn't immediately melt. And this has 156.3, I think it is, melting point. And uh, a Mars of gas, um, we determined to have somewhere between 130 and 133, 134 degrees centigrade in the bolometer. And I think, Slobodan, you used an electron temperature process to calculate the temperature as? Yeah, uh, 120 to 140 degrees C. Yeah, so in the same ballpark range yeah. using completely different um, uh, technology. And uh, the interesting thing was is it, it kind of turned to a jelly sheet. It almost didn't stretch uh, or, or pull down it for a long period of time uh, relative to what you would expect something of that high temperature. Uh, if it was a high temperature, uh, so it, it it the gas temperature thermally on its own was below the melting point of uh, indium, even at Slobodan's highest temperature assessed. So it shouldn't have melted, but it also shouldn't have turned to a jelly, and, and it even stayed as a jelly even uh, when um, the the overall thing was glowing incandescently like a, a hundred watt light filament light bulb like the filament glowing incredibly intensely brightly white and yet it's still hanging there like a jelly sheet uh, flapping in the intense jet from the amaza gas so we're going to see what uh, in uh, the hha does to uh, the uh, the material here and um, this this indium, if it behaves like it did uh, under a Mars gas, we should see the production of carbon and silicon and and so forth, um, and maybe coming out of these volcanoes when the, the when the blob forms, you then get these ejections of, of material that look very similar to that work uh, presented by Takaaki Matsumoto. So I'm I'm led to believe that this is 0 0.05 of a millimeter thick. So that's uh, is that 50 microns or, or something? It's, yeah. Yeah, 50 microns. So it's it's kind of like in the same ballpark as uh, uh, the stuff we had before. Um, okay, so that's that. And then what you see down the bottom here is a stand-in for a 10 yen coin. Where I couldn't find my 10 yen coins whilst I was packing which was embarrassing but uh, uh, so we have a stand in here of a Swiss uh, uh, coin 
Uh, but we will try and find a coin collector or shop or somewhere nearby where we can get a 10 yen coin. They're quite common. Uh, they've been around for over 50 years or something. Um, and uh, so hopefully we can get a 10 yen coin and do an experiment with that. What you're actually seeing here is the back end of the unexposed 2% uh, thorium doped uh, 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 tungsten welding rod that we used in Japan. And uh, this is the material that was cut off the end to look for the material as it was unexposed. And it turns out to be basically thorium and tungsten. And this is the piece that was exposed in the center of the welding rod in the experiment that we did there and we saw uh, in every single sample area uh, these structures these spheres predominantly that always contained calcium and if you look at the Parkamov reaction tables at uh, nanosoft.co.nz when you fission tungsten the products are calcium and uh, xenon and so these are the most likely uh, products, except for isotope 180, which also does fission, but there's a slightly more energetic reaction where it fissions to other elements. However, isotope 180 is a rarer isotope of uh, um, uh, tungsten, and so the pre predominance of all of the isotopes uh, in tungsten will fission uh, to calcium and xenon. And so that is what you see in the prediction, and that is what we observed in the experiment. And so what we want to do is take this sample here, uh, and we want to expose it to the HHO from Slobodan Stankovic's HHO generator, and see if we observe a similar kind of effects. Now, there were structures on here, like there was a magnetohydrodynamic, what I call a uh, pretzel structure, and uh, that had other elements in there as well, uh, some things like sodium and, and uh, other stuff in there as well being synthesized. And maybe we can see something similar going on when we expose this to the, um, the uh, uh, gas. Now, we actually have something that we didn't have before, uh, which I'll talk about, but we have a selection of spectrometers here. So it's possible that we may be able to see the spectrum of xenon coming out when we are exciting this. If we do this, then it is, in my view, going to be 100% slam dunk because we will have already seen the calcium. And if you see the xenon in the signature, xenon is basically not existing in normal air that you breathe. It's vanishingly rare. So to see the spectrum lines of xenon will be extremely exciting. Now, why have I got this face mask here? Maybe you're more familiar than you were when we were using this in 2019. But this is one uh, 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 face mask from exactly the same packet as we used to cover over the inlet of a vacuum cleaner to uh, absorb the particles coming off the tungsten, this particular piece of tungsten, when it was exposed to a Mars gas. So we caught these particles uh, in the filter paper, oh, sorry, the, the filter of the mask. And when we analysed those, um, uh, the particles coming off, the vaporizing, as some people call it, tungsten, we saw the same transmuted elements as we saw on the surface and even emerging from underneath the surface in the tungsten. So for me, that was 100% proof that what you are seeing coming and being synthesized in almost instantaneously in tungsten it, it, it is uh, actually real and not contamination because we cap captured it uh, in the particles. And in the particles, it had tungsten, tungsten oxide, but it also had this calcium and other elements that were being synthesized on the tungsten. So uh, these are the uh, some of the equivalent experiments to what we did with a Mars gas. And so we can do some comparisons. And that means that when we do our experiments with the uh, block here of uh, calcium carbonate and we do uh, our experiments here with the charcoal and if we see the uh, removal of the 14 carbon from the charcoal here when it goes on the Scandinavian uh, beam line um, then uh, we can be pretty sure that Amaza's technology will do the same thing and um, we can have a, a, a fair confidence that our proposal um, for remediating, firstly, the uh, uh, tritium, but also what Yul Brown did, as I said earlier, when you put elements together, and he, he actually did cobalt-60 iron and aluminium shavings, 
and he also did uh, a americium 241 uh, with iron and aluminium shavings and he loaded it with gas loaded it the gas it produced a ball uh, that got brighter and brighter and then it went flash and then uh, the vast majority over i think 95 or 97 percent or something of the uh, emissions from the material were removed and so it is potential that not only can the gas uh, um, be a, a method to remediate the water, the tritium-laced water, it might actually be that the tritium-laced water itself, when it's electrolyzed, the actual water, that the gas that we produce, uh, can be used to remediate the other nuclear waste at the site and clean up the site very much faster and remove that hazard for the planet. So with that, I am going to pause uh, here, the recording, and we are going to then talk about other materials that we have to work with and also uh, detection methods and close out on another author's work. Thank you very much for your time. See you in the next video.